Hi, so um, today we're going to talk about uh, the blockchain. Blockchain is basically the protocol of the technology that powers uh, the very famous cryptocurrency Bitcoin. Um, so quickly a little bit about myself. I am uh, Arnav Gupta, also known as a champion swimmer on the internet on various places. I make apps and websites, I teach programming and I happen to know a bit about cryptocurrencies. So I'm uh, one of the founding members at uh, Coding Blocks. Coding Blocks is a, a software development bootcamp based out of uh, Delhi in India. Uh, we uh, teach students uh, course CS yes, concepts like data structures and algorithms and also uh, things like Android app development, web development uh, and so on. So um, uh, a little background how uh, I got into the world of uh, software development uh, is that I used to work with uh, custom uh, ROMs and Android operating systems like Cyanogen Mod, which has now been renamed to Lineage. Uh, then I uh, was a part of a team uh, called uh, AOKP, which was another custom Android operating system. Um, we uh, integrated really cool features into Android and made custom ROMs. Uh, I also have a few contributions to the Android open source project, which means if you're running any version of Android above uh, KitKat, you'd be running a teeny weeny bit of code that I have written inside the contacts app or the SMS app. Um, after that, uh, during my uh, college days, I interned at a startup called Q26, where we built a few features for some uh, Micromax phones. Micromax is a mobile manufacturer in India. Um, so, wait, I did tell you that I will tell you about Bitcoins, right? So, where does Bitcoin figure in this entire thing? is that uh, back in the day when I used to work with uh, custom uh, ROMs and uh, making custom kernels and all of these uh, hacky stuff, uh, we used to put these up on a website called XDA Developers. And on XDA Developers, it's like voluntary work. So sometimes people donate to the developers for uh, whatever uh, open source development that they're doing and uh, paying money into india uh, back in 2011-12 via paypal was a little cumbersome process so a lot of people used to ask me to set up a bitcoin wallet and i did that and the bitcoin price back then was uh, one bitcoin used to be approximately one dollars okay. um I mostly forgot some of the bitcoins that I got back in those days because uh, I mean bitcoins came into my bitcoin wallet but there was no way to convert bitcoins into Indian rupees so uh, I mean those wallets were really lying dormant and uh, I got renewed uh, interest in bitcoin much later in 2015 um, when uh, we won a hackathon called Hack India it was at that time in 2015 it was India's largest hackathon and uh, the prize was uh, two bitcoins that's what our team won because the sponsor was coin secure which is a bitcoin uh, trading platform uh, in india so uh, where are we with cryptocurrencies now in uh, 2017 uh, let's uh, take a look um, around uh, 150 billion is what's the market uh, cap of bitcoin in uh, us dollars uh, not of bitcoin i'd say it's the market capitalization of all cryptocurrencies taken together bitcoin ether ripple uh, litecoin and uh, many many others uh, there are uh, approximately 50 million regular users of cryptocurrencies so we can say the cryptocurrencies have been a very successful technological advancement so uh, let's go a little deeper and understand um, cryptocurrencies and uh, to understand that we would need to understand two concepts one uh, about economics and one about technology so we'll understand the concept of how money works and we're going to understand how the blockchain technology works so um, Understanding this would require us to understand economics. That's something that a lot of us in technology tend to skip or tend to avoid or uh, don't think important enough to learn. Um, but let's get you a basic economics primer. I would also suggest if you want to get a good idea of economics in a very short time, just Google up the video 30 minute economic machine. It's a really, really nice video. You can take a look at economics, understand the entirety of economics in a 30 minute video. Um, one thing to be understood is that uh, what actually has value is called product 
product can be in a tangible form like somebody makes a mobile phone and that's a product or it could be in form of service so i teach people they pay me money that's also a product um, the more you produce the richer you are so uh, basically people being rich or poor is a factor of what they produce uh, about money money doesn't really exist money is basically a man-made uh, token to help us butter so that we can uh, exchange the products that we make uh, with products that we need that somebody else makes uh, money is, is just a you know uh, a tool a layer that helps the butter process but money doesn't actually exist uh, that's a very important aspect to understand uh, about economics that's why uh, when countries measure which country is richer or which country is more developed we take a term called gdp which is gross domestic product now gross domestic product is measured in us dollars but gdp is we are measuring the product not the money itself now uh, classical currencies like uh, dollars or euros or rupees have some inherent problems one of them is that the value of these currencies are backed by a central bank now this can be susceptible to political instability now uh, most fiat currencies um, they have value because a government of a country says that it has value um, like as a matter of fact one indian rupee is worth one Indian rupee is because the Reserve Bank of India says it is worth one Indian rupee and everybody believes that. Uh, one US dollar is worth one US dollar because that's what the Federal Reserve says so and every American person believes so. But uh, we have seen in cases of countries like Greece or Zimbabwe, uh, this, uh, this uh, uh, central entity which actually backs this value can be susceptible to political instability, the economics of the entire country can crash, and there can be hyperinflation, a lot of stuff like that. Secondly, this money is uh, physical in nature because a lot of the money that we talk about uh, is generated, printed in the form of cash or minted in the form of coins. So uh, these uh, have the problem of storage, security, transportation, preservation, and how we can prevent uh, false notes or uh, forged coins. So we have all these problems and governments across the world, they lose one to 2% of the entire money in circulation every year, which is called the spoilage loss. Another important, uh, uh, important thing is that uh, the ownership of the money is usually more important than the transaction. So uh, this is what leads to the problem of cash theft. Now, unless you actually have noted down the serial number of the notes uh, you had uh, and coins in a lot of countries don't even have serial numbers. So if somebody is able to possess money in whichever way, fair or unfair, he actually owns that money. Uh, and unless we can prove that the transactions were fraudulent or uh, there was a theft, Unless we are able to prove that in some definitive way, uh, a person who has a $100 note has $100 with him. So uh, the value of ownership uh, is usually more important than the value of the transaction as far as classical currencies are con considered because tracking the transactions is usually hard because uh, when you give somebody a, a, a note, a bank note, or you give somebody a coin, unless you take a photograph or something, there is no proof that the transaction actually happened. So end of the blockchain, what does the blockchain do? And this is like usually four points that we see all over the internet, you go read about blockchain and a lot of, you know, blockchain based startups would say these four things that it's secure, there is no such thing as unmarked cash, it's a distributed, there is no central authority, anybody can work on the blockchain, there are no coins, only transactions and it works by consensus. The thing is that these four things about the blockchain, you can read up on a lot of websites, but it does not really tell you how the blockchain works. And at this point, you might be too afraid to ask because it seems like the entire world already knows about the blockchain and you are the only one who does not. So let us understand the concept of the blockchain in a explain like I'm five edition. Okay. 
So let's talk about five people Varun, Abhishek, Bhavya, Bhuva and Aditi and they want to transfer money among each other. So what we're going to do is we're going to take a piece of paper and we start writing who transfers money to whom. And uh, mind you, we have this assumption here that all of them have some amount of money. So when we are talking about Varun giving Aditi rupees 10, we are considering Varun already had a sum of money more than rupees 10. So um, here is an assumption that a lot of cryptocurrencies make is that because people already have been producing something because people already possess some fiat currencies uh, everybody's net worth is already there i mean you own some dollars or you own some rupees already so uh blockchain does not try to solve the problem of ownership it straight away tries to solve the problem of transactions so we write down transactions one after the other like this and obviously at one point of time we are not going to be able to fit all these transactions into a single page so what can we do is we can number each page but the numbers can be forged or the numbers can be mistyped and the data inside each page can also be changed so how about we keep the number of the previous page in our current page so all of these pages get linked to each other but then again pages could get skipped or the data of the previous page can still be modified so you don't have an authentic list of transactions yet so what we can do is we can take a page of data encrypt its data and put it on the second page but then the second page would contain too much data it would have to contain the encrypted data from the previous page plus the new data so that's when we come up with the concept of a hash what we're going to do is we can take a hash of one of the pages and start the second page with that hash so hash is a new word that you're hearing here so let's understand what hash is so hash functions take some data and convert them to a random string the generated hash is completely random and it does not depend on the data. So if you change the data a little bit, the hash changes randomly. So if you know the hash of some data, you cannot predict the hash of another data. It's going to be always random and it's always going to be unidirectional in nature, which means you cannot calculate the data back from the hash. You can always calculate the hash from the data. So you take some data, which is some bytes, and you put it into the hash function and the hash function gives you a string for example yt2a6 that's your hash now from yt2a6 we cannot calculate our data back but every time we put the same exact data byte for byte into the hash function we are every time going to get the same exact string y2 yt2a6 and even if we change a single bit inside that data we are going to get a completely new hash that's what a hash function is there are a lot of hash functions. Some of the common ones are MD5, SHA256, SHA1, so on. Let's talk about another very important concept. That is Merkley trees. What are Merkley trees? Merkley trees help us authenticate a lot of different pieces of data together with the single hash. So let's say we have four transactions, TX1, 2, 3, and 4, and we take the hash of each of these transactions and then we add or let's just say append the hash one and the hash two and we take a hash of this entire data called hash one two similarly we append hash four with hash three and we take a hash of this longer hash and call it hash three four then we hash one two and hash three four in a similar way and we go to something called the root hash now we can reach this root hash only if we have these exact four transactions in this exact order and we again hash them in this particular way we can get to root hash so with root hash we can verify that there has exactly been these four transactions now let's also uh, take a look at another thing we can do with hashes are recursive hash chains so what are recursive hash chains is that we take some data we Take us three data entries happening at three different points of time okay then we add timestamps to each of them and then we take some metadata metadata which is data about data which is like who created this data and who has access to this data where was this data created stuff like that and technically the timestamp is also some kind of metadata and we take this number zero along with it and this entire 
object we call a block. Then we take a hash of this called prev hash and we add the metadata and the timestamp with the second data and we create a new block. And with that, we create another block. Now the beauty of a recursive hash chain is that if you come and make some change to the first piece of data, that's going to change this entire block, which means that this hash, prove hash is also going to change, which means that this entire block actually gets changed, which in turn means that this prove hash is also changed, the third prove hash and the third block is also changed. And if you look at a very long chain, whenever we make some change at a particular link of the chain, all the links ahead of it are going to get changed as well. That is what a recursive hash chain is all about. Now let's put all of these things together and consider this that we have four transactions, we create hashes, we create uh, another set of hashes and we create a root hash. We add a timestamp, we add something called a nonce, nonce means number once generated. So nonce is just random number, we uh, add it to make this data a little more unique in nature, then we call this thing a block. We take a hash from the previous block and this completes our entire block. And similarly, the hash of this block will help us create another block. And when we talk about the first block that ever existed inside this entire chain, that is going to have zero instead of priv hash. And this block is called the genesis block. So all chains start from the genesis block where the priv hash was zero. But this is what we call a blockchain. How does the blockchain really work? So creating new blocks generates new bitcoins. Um, this is very important because that is how the currency grows. Now, we don't want this currency to grow at an uncontrollable rate. We want this to grow at a slow rate so that the inflation is low. Because if you have more money than the products the market creates, you have inflation. Because for example, um, say uh, you're selling biscuits and you create 10 biscuits every day and you also are making coins but you are making 100 new coins every day so every passing day the number of coins available increases and the number of biscuits is not increasing that fast so the price of each biscuit is going to go up so on the day one you will have 10 rupees for each biscuit on day two each biscuit is going to cost 20 rupees and so on So to slow down this process, we want to make the process of generating new blocks very slow. And how do you slow down a computer? You create tougher algorithms. So we put some very specific requirements for the prev hash that we saw here, okay? And uh, because every time you change the nonce, you get a new prev hash. So we make some very specific requirements for the priv hash, which means people have to try out with a lot of different nonces until they match those requirements for the priv hash. There is no central authority. It's truly decentralized is because these hashing algorithms are well known to everybody. So uh, there is no secret out here. Anybody who can create the hashes of those transactions add a nonce and get a valid pre priv hash for the next block can finish this block and that's when we call the block being sealed now anybody can seal that block but whoever gets it there gets there first wins those bitcoins and this process is actually called mining now we do have a little bit of a weakness in the blockchain because every system will have its weakness the weakness will be around the most fundamental theory and the fundamental theory here is that it runs by consensus, it is decentralized. So we have something called the 51% attack. That is, if 51% of the total people who are mining blocks decide to use a new algorithm or they decide to use a different format of prevash or whatever they decide, they're going to win. Because as soon as 51% decide to do something, all the new blocks, those 51% people will be able to reach those new blocks much faster than the other people because they are lesser in number, they're 49%. So 51% people pool their resources together, 
they're always going to reach the next block faster. So when 51% people come together, they can change the course of the blockchain. But that's very similar to how democracy works. We do have a fear of monopoly. There is um, mining bitcoins is always going to be more cost effective where the price is low, electricity price is low. China, the electricity price is really low and that's why a lot of the people mine bitcoins in China and there is a uh, hidden uh, fear that China might monopolize bitcoins. Now, the miners and the mining process is very important. It's because the miners verify the transactions. Now, unless there were miners, we, there, would no, there would be no way to verify the transactions happen. There would be no way to hash those transactions and make them permanent. And these miners are responsible for creating new currency because every time a new block is generated, some new bitcoins are liberated. Uh, we transfer new bitcoins to the person who completed the block. So when we are creating new currency, there are two concepts uh, that we can use. One of them is called proof of work and the other is called proof of stake. Um, Bitcoin uses what is called proof of work right now. Another blockchain based cryptocurrency, Ethereum, has already considered moving to a proof of stake algorithm. In the proof of work, uh, the person who mines Bitcoins has to prove that he had actually mined every Bitcoin. And proof of work generally means anybody who has electricity and enough CPU cores to mine bitcoins can start mining. In the proof of stake algorithm, you invest a bit of money into the cryptocurrency and that means that you have stake, you have uh, a stake in the future of this currency and people who have more stake can verify more transactions. Um, although at the face of it, it looks like proof of stake um, is biased towards richer people. Uh, the fact is that the proof of work algorithm is more biased towards richer people because uh, although you can you know, add hardware linearly to your system, the speed at which you can calculate hashes is going to go up exponentially. So whoever has the maximum amount of money to spend on a Bitcoin mining farm, um, Bitcoin mining farm uh, at a low electricity nation is going to win in the proof of work system. In the proof of stake, how much you believe in the currency is actually what's at stake. So um, there are a lot of challenges that lie ahead for blockchain and uh, some of the major ones are a energy sustainability. A report has shown that 15 million dollars is what we spend every day on mining bitcoins generating each power uh, each block costs as much energy as one american home does in a day uh, six american homes do in a day i'm sorry and american homes already consume a lot of power um, 80 percent of the mining happens in china because of subsidized electricity which has reduced the decentralized nature which was originally promised to us so um if we reach a stage where mining bitcoins costs us more in energy than the number of bitcoins we get out of it, people are going to stop mining. So that's a challenge we need to solve. So basically, we spend electricity to mine coins. Yeah, that's what we do. Uh, anonymity is something that a lot of people think that bitcoin is secure or anonymous. Now, your real name is usually not connected to your wallet's name, but although your your, name, your real name is not connected, every transaction that happened on your Bitcoin wallet is visible to everybody else because that's how it was designed. Everybody can read the blockchain. Now, if somehow the government can start making connections between your real name and the digital wallets that you have used, the government would know every time, every transaction that you either accept or uh, you send. This can hamper privacy and many of the use cases of Bitcoin. So people have been trying to build even more secure privacy focused solutions on blockchain.
another problem is that a lot of people do not understand is that unless you save the primary key of your wallet uh, on your own device or handwrite that on a piece of paper and save it inside save it in your locker or something like that your bitcoins are not really safe a lot of people make accounts on exchanges like coinbase or cex uh, but do keep in mind that when you do not own the private key of uh, your wallet then the money really is not with you the money is with somebody else and you can lose that money at any point of time then there is also a problem of deflationary spiral and that's because the number of bitcoins that can ever be generated is uh, is uh, specified it's limited which means in the future uh, uh, when the number of products that are produced by this world increases and the bitcoins are not increasing then bitcoins will turn out to be deflationary so basically you will be able to buy more and more product with the same amount of bitcoin so um, we need to understand that blockchain is a very revolutionary piece of technology and the only use case of the blockchain is not just creating bitcoins so basically a blockchain is not a currency model although it is used like it and a blockchain is not a ledger although it is used like it and a blockchain is not meant only for transactions so blockchain is just a chain of events a blockchain is a chain of records and the blockchain is distributed and decentralized which means that anybody can help continue the chain which means that we can do a lot of things with bitcoins or with blockchains so you can just take a step back and ask the question what are the places where we need a central authority to verify and establish trust and what are the places where we need to maintain a long list of transactions or events anything that says yes to both these questions is ripe for disruption using the blockchain and some of the examples are voting um, so votes can be considered like transaction and after voting you cannot change your vote and you can create a very robust uh, secure tamper proof voting system based on the blockchain so similarly you can create file storages smart contracts copyright uh, and patents all based on blockchain So let's take a look at some of the people who are building some of the, some of the best technologies on the top of blockchain or smart contracts. So there is NEO, which is a distributed economy. It's uh, like a like a new kind of a way to generate uh, coins. Um, this is very popular in China right now. Stratus is a company that. Uh, helps other companies build blockchain based solutions and they teach about blockchain. Uh, Steam is a really innovative setup. They create, uh, they allow content creators to get money via Steam dollars. Steam dollars are, um, they are the the currency on which Steam runs. And when you read a read a, an article and you like it, you can basically send Steams to them. Um, then there is Golem. Golem is a distributed worldwide supercomputer which means that if a lot of people pull in their individual resources of laptops and desktops, we can create a worldwide supercomputer. That's what Golem believes. Uh, one of my favorites is Basic Attention Token. It has been created by Brendan Eich, the person who has created JavaScript. So uh, Basic Attention Token is a way for advertisers to be able to pay money to uh, um, to website owners even if web ads are blocked on their websites and we have a lot of what's called altcoins altcoins alternative coins and although i personally don't think anything other than bitcoin ethereum ripple and litecoin is actually going to take off but there are a lot of different coins right now available so uh, talking about investing in cryptocurrency that's something that everybody is interested in knowing about and people think that you know you put money into bitcoins and bitcoins are gonna make you rich which is not the case 
it's like just any other commodity you need to follow the news you need to key stay in touch with what has happened in the latest uh, bitcoin uh, developments um, so you know it's not just going to be simply you buy bitcoins and they're going to make you rich also a lot of people have bitcoin success stories i can tell you that i got bitcoins when they were one dollar each and i sold them when they were thousand dollar each but in between that phase a lot of other things happened so uh, a lot of times people are making up stories about bitcoin making them rich just to get other people to invest their money into it and of course the bitcoin exchange rate just keeps going up and up and i have no idea why what's the hype among college students to uh, participate on uh, this platform I don't know but uh, yeah the Bitcoin exchange rate just keeps going up